Welcome back to part two of our series where we are talking about portfolio optimization inside the world of Python. So in our previous video, we did a high level overview about what is portfolio optimization, why it's important to the finance community, and also going through just high level, how do we need to think about this process? We didn't go into any really specific metrics at this point. We're just trying to say, what's the goal of portfolio optimization and, and really why is it used? And why does Python play a role in all of this? Why would we want to use Python to do this particular task? And, and really it just boils down to, usually with a programming language, it's really easiest to do tedious repetitive tasks, which portfolio optimization, well, maybe to some it's not tedious, but it is definitely repetitive if you think about some of the calculation aspects of it. And so it's perfectly aligned with the Python language. It makes doing this process, which is very valuable to a lot of different financial institutions, uh, easier. So it's a great way to kind of get your feet wet with Python if you're new to Python, but you also want to tie it back to some applications in the finance world. So we've imported our library so far. And what we're going to be doing next is basically grabbing our data set, but I'm going to be building it in such a way where if you do not currently have the data, I will be showing you how to download it using uh, the NASDAQ uh, because the NASDAQ does have historical data and there is one particular endpoint that you can call, albeit for free, but the other ones are not free, but this one is free where you can actually grab historical price data. So the first thing that we need to do with anything is we need to define our portfolio and we need to define the stocks in our portfolio. So I'm just going to pick some random ones. These are not necessarily saying these are the ones you should be investing in at this point, but it is something where, you know, we can pull some data and then ideally start running some scenarios. So Apple is a pretty popular stock. It's always popular. They just released the iPhone 12. So that's getting a lot of news. Microsoft, Microsoft is basically just used by every organization on the planet, it feels like. So they have uh, a big uh, threshold and all sorts of different stuff. Square, this does uh, POS sales. So they have a whole uh, point of sale system. They have a whole point of sales infrastructure where they're trying to be the modern point of sale system, all that kind of fun stuff. Amazon, that's another popular one. That's just Everyone uses Amazon for lots of different stuff. So these are just some popular stocks. Again, not saying these are ones you want to necessarily invest in or not invest in, but they are just different things. So we need to define our symbols. Something that's important is we do need to know at any given point how many stocks we have in our particular portfolio. So grab the number of stocks in our portfolio. Well, this is super easy. We're going to call this... Uh, number, number of symbols. It's just going to simply equal the length of our symbols list. Uh, this is just going to be used at different points because some metrics do require us knowing how many symbols we have or how many uh, stocks we have in our portfolio. So having this already kind of pre-calculated just saves a little bit of time uh, down the road. So from here, um, we're going to grab the data, but we're going to write it in such a way where if the data already exists, we don't need to pull it again unless we want to necessarily update it, at which point you would delete it and then you would repull the data. But if you don't already have the data, then what it's going to do is it's going to grab the data for us. Um, if the data is there, then it's just going to load the existing one into a data frame for us. So if we don't have data, grab it from the NASDAQ, right? Nothing super complicated. Stop with the IntelliSense. They updated the notebooks in there. God. Okay. So if not, so if this does not exist, so if pathlib dot path, so if this file does not exist, and I'm going to copy my file path so I can show you. So if the file does not exist, so we're going to call the exist method, exist returns true if it exists, false if it does not exist. So if not true, do something. What is that something? Well, first, let's initialize our price history client. So I'm going to call this initialize 
the price history client. As you can tell, I'm so excited with this new little IntelliSense feature. Price history. With price history, it does require that you pass through your symbols. Luckily for us, we defined our symbols up above. So we're just going to pass through our symbols. Well, when we pass it through, it does have a, a, uh, a, a data frame inside of it. So I can grab that data frame object and I can write the content to it to a data frame. So I'm going to call uh, uh, grab the data and dump it to a CSV file. And then from here, I'm going to say price history client. There is a price data frame property that returns a data frame object, at which point I can use the to CSV uh, method. And then I can just pass through the location of where I want that CSV file dumped. I'm going to call it stock data.csv. And then in this particular situation, I do not want the indexes of the data frame. I don't care about the indexes of the data frame. Additionally, from here, I will print out uh pretty print the price history client uh price data frame uh also with this particular one you can also use display i think i'll leave it there i don't know if it's going to work i think you might have to actually import but basically for notebook display is the print and then from here uh grab the data frame and store it in a variable so grab the data frame and we'll call this price data frame equals a, well, more importantly, it's going to be a pandas data frame. So I'm going to use type hinting here. So all this is saying is, hey, this variable is going to be of the type pandas data frame. I'm going to take my price history client and I'm going to grab my price data frame uh, property that returns it. So this is if you do not have the data currently in the folder. Now, if you do, then guess what? I'm just going to load the data. So load the CSV. I'll be more explicit. Load the existing CSV file. And then from here, it's going to be price data frame. Again, I'm going to be very explicit and I'm going to tell IntelliSense that this variable is a pandas data frame. I'm going to use the pandas library. There is a read CSV method, at which point I can just pass in this little guy up here, it's right there. And then from here, I can print out, it's weird, it's kind of like tabbing in, and then I can uh, print out the price data frame dot head. So I'm going to first delete it. I'm going to delete it so we can see it in action. Oh, sorry. Why? Oh, this one is too. So if I'm putting the file path, I'm going to put an R in front of it to say raw string. So this is just simply a, uh, a nice way. Now, if it keeps coming up, that means there's a hidden character that is potentially not there. Oh, and then with this one, I have one other thing I do need to pull in here. So I'm just going to slowly go back up here and show you. I forgot about that. So in order to use the NASDAQ API behind the scenes, like you have to mimic a user agent. So there's actually a Python library that helps you mimic a user agent. <laughs> and so it's called fake underscore user agent. And then from there, you would import the user agent class. And with this user agent class, um, you can specify the basically the browser that you're on. And so one of them is called Edge. That's obviously for Microsoft Edge. And with this one, uh, it's called User Agent. I'm just going to double check to make sure I, oh no, see, this is why I check it, because it's wrong. So you initialize the class, and then from here, you if you, I think if you go down to some of them, there's like Edge, there's Chrome, 
I'm on Microsoft Edge, so you just put Edge. If you're on Chrome, you put Chrome, and it basically just mimics the browser that you're in, and then this would allow you to then grab the, the data for you. Oh, because I need to run this one again. Come on. Okay, so it's executing it behind the scenes, and basically with the NASDAQ one, I wish I had a URL to, to show you. And it looks like, of course, it didn't save it like it should have. Why does it not like it? Let's do this. Let's be even more explicit, because apparently it doesn't like that I put that in there. I'll put a raw symbol right here. And then I'll call this stock data CSV. We'll run it again. There we go. That worked the second time. File paths. It's a wonderful thing. So you can see right here that it does have our data in here. And so I'll actually change this to display because it's a little bit uh, nicer. But you can also see that on the second time running it, it never did this portion because why? Well, it's already here. It doesn't need to run that portion again. Now, I will tell you, if you need to add your daily data to it, then obviously you would need to uh, delete the file or run it, or you could just modify the code and say, hey, update or something like that. There's many different ways to it. I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do that, but different ways. But at this point, you can see that we now have a data frame here. Ideally, if I go into it, I can see there's Square, Microsoft, Apple, blah, 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 blah. not too much data. There's only like 509 rows, so that's nothing super crazy. But, you know, a little bit of data goes a long way. Now, if you do want to kind of grab the data on your own in a separate script, I do have that here for you as well. Obviously, you would need to change your user agent, and then obviously you would need to change your symbols if you want different ones. This I'm assuming that not everyone's going to be on edge like me. And then obviously you can change this as well. You can print it out. There's obviously different things you can do with it. But this way, if you want to kind of keep it separate from the notebook, here's a little script where you can just kind of use it as is. And ideally, you could just you know run it and then you would be fine. So this works a little bit better uh, than workbooks. I mean, notebooks, because notebooks kind of are like their own little workspaces. And we've kind of seen right here that this can kind of get messed up a little bit when it comes to file paths. So you, you just have to be a little bit aware that sometimes your file paths will work in a separate script because it's considered the workspace, but then you go into your notebooks and then all of a sudden it's not working. You're like, why is it not working? It's probably because of that file path. So just if you're in a notebook, I always tend to be very, very explicit in my notebooks compared to when I am uh, working, you know, directly with a a script. I don't know why that was so hard to say. How long is this going? Okay, I haven't lost my mind yet. <laughs> I'm like, maybe it's going too long. Um, okay, so now we need to transform the data because right now it looks fine, right? You're like, oh, this looks like a normal data frame. However, we need to modify it a little bit because when we calculate certain metrics, I need to have each individual uh, stock in their own columns. I need one for Amazon. I need one for Microsoft. I need one for Square. I need one for Apple. So basically, I want to try to mimic what I'm seeing right here. And so in order to do that, it just needs to reorganize the data frame a little bit. So what we're going to do is I'm going to grab um, certain columns, and then I'm going to get rid of other ones. So since we don't need all the columns, uh, we can just kind of limit it first. So grab the columns we need. In this situation, I'm going to say price data frame equals price data frame. And then I only need the date column. I only need the symbol column. And then I only need the close column. And then once I do that, I should have a more kind of simplified data frame because now I only have the date, the close, and then the symbol. But I need to pivot it where this so this symbol column is now your column headers. So the unique values in this one are now the column headers. So I'm going to pivot the data frame 
to make the symbols the headers. And then from here, this is super easy as well. Pandas is great for doing these type of things. I'm gonna do my price data frame. There is a pivot method. And then with this one, the index in this situation will be the date column. The, val the columns will be the uh, symbols, so the, the symbol column. And then our values will be the close column. And then from here, I'm going to display the price data frame. So this is just simply putting it where it's just transforming the data. So now we have a pivoted data frame. So now our dates are the index, the value is the actual close price, and then the column headers are now the unique individual stock symbol. So we've pivoted the data. And then from here, I'm going to cut it off. And then in our next video, we're going to start talking about metrics. We're going to run through one single iteration to show you what's going on behind the scenes. We're then going to simulate a Monte Carlo simulation, and then we're going to do the optimized formulas and all that kind of fun stuff. So at this point, if you have any questions about loading the data into a pandas data frame, pulling the data using the PyOp library, or just general questions about this process, feel free to put those down in the comments below. Again, if you are new to the channel, feel free to subscribe to it. And if you want up-to-date notifications as we release videos, then you're gonna wanna make sure you wanna turn on a little bell, a little, was it gray or red bell? I can't remember what it is, but you wanna turn on a little bell and it turns on notifications for you. So that way, as I release videos, you get up-to-date notifications. So. Thank you again for watching, everybody. We will see you in video number three.